just fire this guy up. So yeah, the title of this talk is Pixel Art and JavaScript. So we're going to talk about how to create different types of pixel art. And specifically, we're going to talk about how to create pixel art in a web browser, and then how to animate pixel art and output those animations to HD video. I did get married last weekend. Um, my name is Vince Allen, and I'm a software engineering manager at Spotify. You can get in touch with me at Vince Allen Vince on Twitter and find all the code for the demos at this repo. Just a quick disclaimer about the code. It uses just vanilla JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. There's no Flash, Canvas, Java, or other assorted impurities. This commercial is based on a true story. Hello? Tracy, no, we don't need a babysitter tonight. Thanks, anyway. After a family bought an Atari video game, they had no trouble getting babysitters. Oh, boy, God. Hello. Okay, if you couldn't hear that, the basic theme is this family bought an Atari video system, and now all the babysitters want to come over and babysit because they want to play Atari. Um, contrary to what this would imply, when I got my Atari, I didn't spend more time with my parents. I spent more time with pixel art. So the Atari gave me my first glimpse at pixel art, and I spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours playing games like Air Sea Battle here. These are the types of images I was interacting with. You know, they were, they were simple, and they're an abstraction of the real, of the real world, and they were certainly an abstraction from the fantastic worlds depicted on the cartridge's packaging. <laughs> this is miniature golf, if you can believe it. Um, but they framed a world that I escaped in for hours and hours and hours, day after day. This is the Atari 2600's color palette. It had 128 colors. And I guess, you know, you compare the 2600 to a modern console, um, it would be technically kind of limited. And I remember the first time I had discovered a glitch in Atari's combat, and I could drive my tank outside of the defined game area. And this confirmed this impression that I had that this game space was actually limitless. And like the tragic hero of Atari's bowling, I stood at the center of a vast universe with no audience to cheer my accomplishments. But this was the 70s, and you know, there's a lot about the 70s that we've left behind. And I think before we look at what we're doing with pixel art now, we should ask the question, is pixel art really just a cultural artifact that we reference just to be nostalgic? I mean, are we doing anything new with pixel art? So let's look at some modern examples of the 8-bit pixel art style. So this is Sword and Sorcery, and it was released in 2011. I think by 2013, it sold 1.5 million copies. And if you want an example of cinematic pixel art, this is it. This is one of my all-time favorite games. This is Ridiculous Fishing. Last year, it won iPhone's Game of the Year. It's a really interesting pixel art style. And Minecraft, of course. I remember the first time I saw Minecraft, and I was like, ah, you know, this is 3D pixel art. And Minecraft just announced that they have over 100 million registered users. So people play a lot of pixel art games. Um, they probably make up the most popular games that we play today. But what about upcoming games? What do we have to look forward to? So these are screenshots from a game that I supported on Indiegogo called Riot. And it's a riot simulator. You either play as the rioters or you play as the police. Um, and it has a really cool cinematic style. You know, um, the game director and designer, his name is Leonard Minkyari, and he has not released or he hasn't published a release date. But I'm really looking forward to playing this game. Another game that I'm looking forward to is called Spirits by Holden Boyles, and he ran a successful Kickstarter campaign, and I, I really like this game, or I'm looking forward to playing it, because it reminds me of the first games I played when I had my first computer. I really like, it's kind of this vintage 8-bit style. But 
you can go outside and find pixel art. This was photographed in New York's East Village in 2008. And I remember the first time I saw Antony Gormley's work, and he's a sculptor, and his, his abstraction of the human form really reminds me of pixel art. If you're looking to hang something up on your wall, you can upload your art to ixy.com. They'll convert it to pixel art and send you the individual pixels to just paste up on your wall. Or a group called 1130 will pixelate your favorite album covers and send you a framed copy. So back to the question. You know, I, I think whether it's, it's commercial art or high art or street art or game art, I think pixel art is more popular today than it's ever been. So in 2008, I moved into a big Brooklyn loft that had high ceilings and, and, and big blank walls. It was right around the time the Obama campaign was using Shepard Fairey's poster. And I, I thought it'd be really cool to get this on my wall, but I wanted it in a large format. I wanted it like floor to ceiling. And you couldn't just go out and buy something like that. Right, so I'd seen people do post-it note art before. And I thought, all right, that might be kind of a cool solution. So I wrote a script that matched or mapped the colors in the original poster to the available colors in the post-it note palette. And it looked like this. And this is the same thing on my kitchen. So this is 10 feet high by 7 and a half feet wide and took about 1,300 post-its. You guys remember this GQ cover? <laughs> so this is a 10-foot high Megan Fox made out of post-its in my living room. And uh, we saved on some post-its because I don't even know if they make black post-its, but we just used the uh, negative space and let the black paint bleed through. My roommates, I think, were really kind of, at this point, a little concerned about what was going to, where this eventually was going. Um, but creating post-it note art is actually kind of hard. It's physically challenging. You're up and down a ladder a lot. It's kind of frustrating because the post-it notes don't necessarily stick as long as you'd like them to. So I started creating digital Post, uh, digital pixel art. And these are just from a game that I was working on. And this is, this is me imitating a, uh, a Batman cover. And so I, I really liked the big, blocky, old Atari style, and I guess maybe it was something about the post-its. But all of these pieces, these digital pieces, were static. And I really wanted some animation. I wanted to make them move. And being a JavaScript developer, I really wanted to make it happen in a web browser. And I, I thought about what I was doing with the post-its. You know, a, a big pixel really it just has four properties. It's just an X and Y location, a color, and a scale. And surely, you know, any modern web browser can handle that. So the first solution I came up with was called the Big Block Framework. And the Big Block Framework tried to approach this problem literally. So the browser window was the wall, and HTML divs were the post-its. I'll explain how it works. So we've heard a little bit about animation, and you know, there's typical strategies like having an animation loop and hitting DOM elements and updating their style properties directly to get what you want. And I tried that here, and it was really, really slow. So I came up with another solution. I thought, all right, well, this is a really finite universe, all right? This is a, a grid of 8 by 8 pixels, and um, there's only so many locations on this grid. And I have a fi you know, fixed palette. There's only so many colors. So I went ahead and I pre-calculated all the possible positions, all the possible colors, and just generated styles for them, just generated CSS. And then when I wanted to animate, I just switched out the class names, and it turned out this was actually like several times faster. So if I wanted something at column 15, I would just give it a class name like column 15. It would do this at 60 frames per second. So that I'll just show you an example really quick. This is also about the time that Apple announced it was going to block Flash on the iPhone. I thought it'd be really funny to make something called This Is Not Flash because I was doing something that was like Flash. Um, but yeah, this is just an example of divs. You know, it's kind of animating, and their classes are changing so fast that it just kind of creates this illusion of 
of this fire, and there's a little interaction. And I was doing things with just little, little physics simulations. This kind of stuff. Particle systems. I remember the first time I saw Reggie Watts and thought he'd be an excellent pixel art character, easily recognizable. And this is, he does a little dance here. There he goes. So the thing is, there's a problem with this approach. So when you're in a little window, we have a, a small finite universe pre-calculating Every possibility is, is kind of doable, but when you go to a large format, which is kind of what I wanted to do, it became just impossible for the browser to hold all of the possibilities in memory, um, and it just became way too slow. And really the problem here was that I was making a one-to-one -one correspondence between a pixel and a div, and I needed to figure out a way to render a pixel in the browser without using the DOM. So my approach, I called the, uh, the uh, bit shadow machine. I'll explain how it works. All right, so we are going to use the DOM, but we're going to only use one DOM element. And we're going to position it at the top left. And we're going to give it a width and height of zero. And when we do that, it disappears. It has no dimension, and we can't see it. But what's cool about what I believe is the browser's true post-it note equivalent, which is the CSS box shadow, is that CSS box shadows can still be seen if their parent has a width and height of zero. And there's other really cool things about box shadows that are going to help us out. I can position them, and what I've done here is just positioned it using the X and Y offset, and it appears kind of in the middle of the screen. So, yeah, some other cool things. One parent can have n number of box shadows. So that's really important if we want to actually create pixel art. Box shadows, like I said, can have a 2D location relative to the parent, but they also can have a blur value, and that's really interesting. And their scale property is just basically their spread. They can have RGB or HSL, hue, saturation, and lightness. And they can carry an opacity via the color property, the alpha property in the color. So I said earlier that what I was looking for was some way to, to represent four properties, right? So box shadows give me those four properties and even more, which is really cool. So then to create shapes, all you need to do is, is just position my box shadows against my one parent. So let me show you what this looks like in action. All right, so here's a very simple example. And I've got a box shadow. And he's just sitting there in the middle of the screen. I'm going to open up the dev tools so you can see. I've got a just container here. But here's the world I was talking about. All right, it's just got a width and height of zero. And if I zoom in here, you can see that there's one box shadow. And he's just sitting there, right? So let's make him move. So now it's just undergoing a gravity simulation. And if I pop open the dev tools, you can see its Y location is just updating. It'll peek up over the screen. OK, so that's cool. But what was the big payoff with all this, right? So I was looking a way to improve performance when animating a lot of things, right? So the big payoff is that I can animate a lot of things because I have a really flat render tree in the DOM. This is a 1,000 box shadows, and they're all doing the same gravity simulation, but now 60 frames per second, and 1,000 is actually pretty nice. With the other solutions, I was only getting like 80 or so. Cool, thanks. So remember I, I talked about a blur property. So what's nice is if we have this animation loop, and I know the velocity of my, my objects here, I can map them, the velocity, to the blur. And essentially, as they speed up, they get blurrier. And I'm basically I'm getting a cheap motion blur effect from the CSS box shadow. So that's kind of fun. I mean, we can actually do some interesting things with that. But how many box shadows can you have? You know, we just saw 1,000. 
I was thinking about this when I was reading a book by Keith Peters. It's called Playing with Chaos, and it was written for JavaScript developers who want to explore creating fractal patterns and creating or using algorithms to create like chaotic patterns. And so I wrote a uh, box shadow fractal generator, and I'm going to reload it to get something interesting. Whoa, I've never seen that. Um, but if we zoom in, you can see these are I mean, these are all box shadows. But how many box shadows do we have? 29,525. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's see what it looks like to have a box shadow galaxy. So this is just basically a chaotic pattern generator. So if I can do this, right, I certainly can render some pixel art. And certainly could render a cat. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking each frame and interrogating the four properties that I need for every pixel. Now, I created these frames in Photoshop, and it would be a real pain to have to go in to Photoshop and do this manually. So I created a tool to collect all the data for me, and I call the tool the Bit Shadow Press. So I'm going to go ahead, and these are the bitmaps, right? So here's this cat doing its thing. If I select these, then the script goes ahead and interrogates all the frames for me. And I get the nice cat, but I also get the data. Oh, I can also do this, change the speed. Um, so yeah, here's all the data that describes what's happening in every single frame. So it's a lot, but I can dump it off into the BitShadow machine and I can have one cat or many cats. So that's kind of cool. This is only 400 or so box shadows, so we could have even more. I've been thinking about an animation that stars a little milk box with legs, and um, he lives on a farm, and this is him. This is him running away from home. So we can do some conventional pixel art style of animation. We can also kind of go even further and do some more kind of physics simulation with these box shadows. So this is, let's see how many, you know, 100 or so box shadows chasing an invisible target and they are observing a flocking behavior. And remember I talked about HSL color. The, the effect here is really subtle, but when they speed up, they lose saturation and they gain lightness. And then they also have their blur mapped to their velocity so they get faster or blurrier as they get faster. And I really was kind of taken with this idea of, of blur and motion blur and just did something to really kind of explore, like, does this look really super realistic? And when I, when I did this, is I stopped thinking about CSS, you know, and I stopped thinking about box shadows, and this really felt like video to me, but it wasn't. And I, I wanted to figure out a way, how could I take this and, and create HD video? So I'll just show you how I did it. I used Photoshop and I used Node. So with the latest version of Photoshop, you get something called Adobe Generator. And Adobe Generator lets you automate tasks in Photoshop using Node. So you're essentially writing Photoshop plugins with JavaScript, and that's really powerful. So what I did was, a lot like the Bit Shadow Press, I just automated collecting the data as this animation ran and saved out all the files, passed it off the generator, and generator then instructed Photoshop to recreate that frame object by object, and then it flattens the file. I take all the files and then I create video. So this is the same simulation just done as HD video.
you can see, I can get a lot more objects in the scene. I'm not constrained by the browser anymore. Now you can see the motion blur is actually, it's, it's actually accurate. It's blurring in the direction that the uh, objects are traveling. Previously, it was just kind of like a fuzz. So I thought, since we had time, I would actually show you that process. Like, this is like a live demo. Um, give me just one second kick it off. So I'm just going to go ahead and fire up a plugin that I wrote to deal with capturing or rendering this little animation. So if I wanted to take this animation, this is an oscillation simulation, and I wanted to render it as video, I would capture all the data, and I'm going to skip that step, but it's kind of, you can imagine what happens. And I have all these data files. If I load up Generator, it says I have a plugin that's been loaded. And I go into Photoshop, and I look under Generate. It's going to tell me I have to do it again. And if I go back, there it is. All right, so I'm going to fire it off. And you can see that you know, I'm, it's just doing what it wants, or what it's told to, I guess better said. And um, you can see that what it's doing, every object is a new layer, and it is creating file number one. And here we go, we're creating file number two. And you can see the frames start to build. And if I look at the terminal, I can see how long it takes. You know, it's so 10 to 15 seconds per frame. Eventually, I'll get to enough frames to render 30 seconds of video or so on. Be kind of fun. So I'm going to stop this. So th that whole little orb that was this guy. When I did this, I thought I really kind of like this idea of a blob of energy, and wanted to kind of play with it and see if it would be interesting to create different variations of this, right? And this is just one where we've kind of put more objects in here and made it a little denser. This is another where I'm using Perlin noise to alter the parameters of the oscillation. So you get this kind of crazy, furious ball of, of energy here. So what would it look like if we did this as video and we just threw all the variations that I could come up with? It would look like this. Brendan Jameson is a sculptor who had a Kickstarter project recently. And he wanted to raise money to build a sculpture garden created entirely of sugar cubes. And I thought, you know, it's like an edible Minecraft. But, you know, it also made me think, you know, what is a, what is a pixel? And to me, you know, a pixel, it's like the, it's the building block of our imagination. And it represents creative possibility. And when I see one, you know, I have the irresistible urge to add more. And I hope you feel that way too. And I hope you've had a great Empire JS. So all the code, I didn't really go into a lot of code. 
but uh, you can find it here at these repos. And if you have any questions, I'll be at the bar, I'm pretty sure, which we will soon be hitting. And Ben forgot your toaster. <laughs>